I had no idea who I was. <laughs> I think I know most of you. I started coming here about a, a year ago. I'm a newbie to Sherman Oaks Press compared to most of you. But I got to know Zach, and as he's known you, it's very hard not to share your story. And when he heard my story, he wanted me to one day come up here and share it with you, so here I am. I am a cancer survivor. Many people say that I'm a walking miracle. My doctor says that I'm the longest living individual that has brain metastasis. What I know is that I've had um, metastatic melanoma for 34 years. It's come, it's gone, it's come back. Um, and the only reason why I'm able to stand here and be here is because of God's divine intervention. And I am so grateful for that. I bless him every day. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to share today. I ask, Lord, that you would just use what I have to say for your glory and for your good. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let me say at the outset that if I were to actually share my, uh, share my testimony in complete, We'd be here till next Tuesday. <laughs> and so I'm just going to share a bit of it. And if you would like to read my story, um, the website is on the screen. Uh, but that's for you. If you'd like to have lunch, I'd be happy to oblige. And I'd share it there as well. But let me, let me just say that um, at the outset, I was wondering how I could put this into a biblical context. And so I thought about that, and I came up with the book of James. James is a wonderful book, and as you may know, James was the head of the church in Jerusalem. He was also a half-brother of Jesus. And so being who he was and where he achieved to, you might think that he would have time to think about what's important before, before he wrote his letter. And so as he wrote his letter, he starts in a very profound way. You might think that he would talk about salvation, some of the most important things that Jesus had to say. He could talk about love, talk about God's mercy. He doesn't do any of those things. But what he says is very profound. What he does is he answers that long asked question, what is God's will for my life? Believe it or not, believe it or not, that's how he starts his letter. And Joel, if you'll put it up the screen, this is what he says. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, when I hear that I'm supposed to consider it joy when I get involved in trials, I want to say, wait a minute, James. You need to think some more. <laughs> Joy is not the adjective I put with it. I might put anger, frustration. Some of those adjectives might fit. So why in the world would James say, consider it joy? Well, he says the only way that you're going to be able to create perseverance, build perseverance, is but through trials. Now that's no fun, but it's necessary if you want to get to the third step. And the third step is that we might become mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, the word for mature in Greek is the word pistis, and it might be also, it is also translated perfect. The word complete can also be translated as, as, as entire. So if you read that then, what he's saying is that as we produce endurance, we want to let it have its perfect result, that it, we might become entirely perfect. Now, we hear that and we say, well, that's silly. Only Jesus is entirely perfect. Until we think about it from God's perspective. Because what God wants from us is that we would become the people that God created us to be. And as we become God's people, as he's created us to be, from his perspective, we will become entirely perfect. 
and we will be able to make a different a difference in his kingdom for his sake and for his glory so I want to say just real briefly that I want to just affirm the fact that God did not give me cancer I did that all by myself all of the weeks weekends that I went to Costa Mesa and Newport Beach and burnt myself to a crisp by not putting on enough sun lotion that was the genesis of my disease not God but God has used it for amazing amazing purposes and I'm grateful for it as I said I'm just going to share a little bit of my testimony but here we go I was at Fuller Seminary years and years and years ago studying to be a pastor and I felt a lump underneath my left arm and I had a doctor at the church I went to and I went up to him and said what, 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 what's the deal and he looked at it and said oh that's just an inflamed lymph node but probably a 2% chance it might be something else so why don't you just run down to UCLA and get a biopsy. So the following Thursday I was in that doctor's office and he was reading the results and he said Scott I'm sorry it's it's not an inflamed lymph node it's actually uh, melanoma but it's a secondary thing so it is moved from its primary area and so it is metastatic melanoma I didn't know what that meant but okay now I was a healthy guy an athlete I didn't get sick well occasionally but not cancer I didn't know it. I mean, I was shocked that he would say that. But I said, okay, well, what, what do I do? And he said, well, you have three options. You can have chemotherapy, you can have radiation, or you can have surgery. And I said, well, I don't know. What would you do if you were in my place? And the doctor said, well, I'm a surgeon. And if I were in your place, I would have it surgically removed so it's out of my body. I took a deep breath and I said, okay, well, I'm in the middle of my quarter at school and if we could wait five weeks, we can have the surgery after I'm out of the quarter and I'll take next quarter off so that I can be free to recover. And he looked at me and he said, Scott, I was thinking more like tomorrow everything went cold it's serious it's moving he doesn't want to wait five weeks I get it okay what do we do they said well I will have my nurse reserve an operating room as quickly as we can and so call me in the morning call my office in the morning we'll tell you what we've been able to come up with and so I went home and I immediately called Fuller and I said, I need to drop my classes because I'm going to have an operation this next week or in the near future. And he, uh, Fuller was amazing because they actually not only dropped my classes after the drop period, but they gave me my money back, which was <laughs> a grateful thing. Anyway, I called the next morning and the doctor said, well, we were able to reserve an operating room for next Monday morning. So you need to check into the hospital on Sunday afternoon. So I said, well, that's great. I, able to, I was the director of student, uh, junior high ministries at Bel Air. And so I was able to share with the kids on Sunday morning that I was going to have to take some weeks off because I was going to have an operation the next morning. And while I was there, I was talking to my doctor, who happened to be a member of the church. And so I said to him, after services, how long do I have to live? What a crazy question. Doctor, how long do I have to live? I told him the results, of the diagnosis. And he said, Scott, I don't like that question. I said, well, I want to know. And he said, you know, if I told you you had five years left and you lived four, your family would be furious with me because they would tell me that they weren't able to be prepared. And if I said you had four years left and you lived longer, your family would be furious at me because they said that I gave them false fear. I, I, I'm not a good guesser. I can't answer that question. So I said, okay, take me out of the realm. What do statistics have to say? Mm -hmm. 
If, I, if I'm not a part of this, what do statistics have to say for an individual who is in a situation? And the doctor looked at me and said, for the other year. This is in 1981. And so I, wait, 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 I don't have a lot of time. So I uh, sat back and said, ouch. But I said, okay. Next day, um, or on that Monday, I went into the medical center and uh, got checked in, got my room. And as you might imagine, I was a nervous wreck. I had cancer surgery the next day, and I had no idea what was going on. Later in that afternoon, toward the evening, a doctor came into my room with a consent form I was supposed to sign. I found out he was my anesthesiologist, and he was there to explain to me what was going to happen the next morning, pre-op, pre surgery, post-op, the whole thing. And he was going to tell me about the possibilities, the negative possibilities that might happen that I had to sign off on. And so he's going through that. You know, the first thing he was telling me about is the fact he's to stick a tube down my throat to my airway um, for anesthesia, and I might, he might scrap it. He might give me too much or too little anesthesia. I might have a heart problem. Um, he gets through this bullet list of things that could possibly happen. Of course, he said they never happen, but I've just got to share these with you. The last one on the list is, well, it's surgery, and so I've got to tell you that you, have, there's an, you, you might die. And I said, oh, great. Takes a pen out of his pocket, hands me the pen, gives me the consent form, I need you to sign this form. So I said, okay, great. If I sign this form, they'll do surgery tomorrow morning and I might die on the table. Great. If I don't sign the form, then they'll postpone the surgery and I'll die of cancer. Great. So I signed the form and uh, laid back and just started to sweat in the bed. And it was getting later and later and I was kicking the sheets around. There's no way I was going to sleep. I some sleep because I had surgery in the morning. So it got pretty night and I was looking across the little tiny room I was in and of course there was a hollow clock on the wall. White background, black hands. And I looked at it and just, I just happened to notice it was two minutes before midnight. And I laid back and I said, okay, if I'm going to get some sleep, I need to close my eyes and I just need to relax. So then I could be in a, a mode of sleep and maybe I'll go to sleep. And so as I closed my eyes, literally something came into my room. And as it came into my room with my eyes closed, I just felt this incredible peace come with it. Now, I had no idea what was going on, but I knew that I didn't want to open my eyes because this spell or this trance, whatever it was, would, would stop. And I didn't want it to stop because that peace felt so good. And so I let it just absor absorb me. I it was so real, I felt like I, if I had sat up and reached out, I could have touched something solid. So I was there for probably a minute, maybe a minute and a half, just ab absorbing all this, and then all of a sudden it just left. I had my eyes closed and kept them closed until I, I was really sure it was gone. And then I opened my eyes and I looked at the clock and it was two minutes after midnight. So it didn't take very long. But it was an amazing thing. And I just absorbed it. And the next thing I knew, so I had looked at the clock, closed my eyes again. The next thing I knew, there was a nurse shaking my shoulder, saying, Scott, you've got to get up. We've got surgery. It's time to get up. And I just, whoa. And so I got up and washed my face, ready to go down for surgery. And they put me on the gurney. And as I was going down to surgery, it dawned on me that I didn't have any fear. All of the anxiety was gone. It, it was just unbelievable. And then it, Last night, what happened, it must have been with God. The Holy Spirit came into my room, and he took with him when he left all of the responsibility for, for the cancer. It was no longer mine. It's his. 
And I can tell you from that night, or at least from that night until today, I have not worried for a moment about my cancer. It's because it's not mine. It was just, just it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, the God part um, is just overwhelming. But I had surgery. Surgery went okay. Back in my room. And I was thinking about what God had to say about, or what the doctor had to say about the fact that uh, the average Joe had three years left to live. And so I called Fuller. I dropped, I mean, I was done. I was no way I was going to spend the last three years of my life reading books and writing papers. <laughs> I was a full time, I had a full time job as the director of junior high ministries, and I love those kids, and that was the way I was going to spend the remainder of my life, is just, just ministering to them with all that I had. And that just sounded wonderful to me, and so that's what I did. Um, for those doctors, nurses, and those in the know will tell you that if you have cancer, what you can look forward to is a five-year mark. Because if you can go five years without having cancer, they say you're in remission. Now, people have go five years, they go, oh, I'm in remission, cancer's gone! Nope, that's not the way it works. Remission simply means that the odds of your cancer coming back are about the same as another cancer completely different from the one that you have coming and getting you somewhere else. So the cancer's not gone, it's in remission. So I went five years from that first surgery, and we took a deep breath and said hallelujah and had our remission party. And a month later, they found something in my small intestine. So long story short, I'm in the hospital. Three days into the hospital, they've been looking and looking and took an MRI, and nothing seemed obvious. But the doctor said there's something there. And Scott, if um, nothing happens this evening, if, something, if it doesn't go away tomorrow morning, I'm going to need to do exploratory surgery to figure out what's going on. So. I called my prayer warrior friends, my wife, were sitting in my hospital room that night, seven or eight of us, this individual has a guitar, we're singing, praising God in between the songs, they're praying for me, and I'm lying in my bed and I'm, the door is open and people are coming down the hallway, kind of looking in, seeing what's going on, and I see one individual who's larger than the rest walk by, and then all of a sudden, he must have hesitated because he came back, looked in the doorway, and um, as if he was going to do something, all of a sudden he was gone. I can tell you that within four minutes, he was back, came into the doorway, I pointed at him, and everybody that was around the room singing stopped singing and looked at him. And so he said to me, he said, uh, I, I'm a pastor, and I was just praying with one of my congregants, and I came by your room, and God said to me, go in there and pray for him. And so I was going to come in and pray for you, but I saw all that was going on, and you were singing, and I said, I must have heard God wrong. So I left and went down the elevator to go home. And before the elevator doors opened, I heard God say to me, don't you even think about getting into this elevator wow. until you go back and pray for that individual. Wow. Come on. So here I am. And I was just wondering if I could pray for you. Wow. And I, I can't tell you that I even get emotional. I was lying in that bed, and we were praying that God would come and get rid of this cancer or whatever it was so I didn't have to have surgery tomorrow. And he sends it to a person. So he comes in the door, and this is what he says. Exactly. He said, okay, what am I going to pray for? I said, well, we're not sure. The doctor wants to do exploratory surgery tomorrow, but there's something wrong with my gut. And he, he actually put a smile on his face. And he says, that's what I pray for best. It's guts. <laughs> and so the, 
group of us are just absolutely thrilled that God sent a gut specialist to pray for me. And so he prayed. We were absolutely convinced that the deed was done. I didn't have, the, whatever it was in my gut was gone. And so everybody left, excited, thrilled. Um, my wife prayed for me, and she left. Full expectation that in the morning I'd have a CAT scan, and it would be it, proof positive that God came and did an amazing thing. So the next morning, doctor comes in, sends me down for the CAT scan, comes back. And he says, Scott, well, I'm sorry that there's still something there. We're going to have to do the exploratory surgery. You know, I wanted to say, no, 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 you don't get it, doctor. God came last night, and I'm fine. No, there's something there. They do surgery. They find a tumor inside my small intestine. He takes it out, takes out a foot of my small intestine, sews it back together, and um, I recover. And I'm asking myself, what happened? I thought God showed up. What's the deal, God? Well, I don't know. You know, God may have made that tumor accessible to the doctor. God may have taken a larger tumor and made it smaller so that it was easier to pull out. Maybe God didn't do a thing, but he wanted to help that individual that prayed for me to understand what it means to be obedient. I, I don't know. But God was with me because of the fact that we got through surgery and I came out of it okay. It's just that uh, I think what he wanted to share with me is that his ways are certainly not my ways. I mean, I had my agenda. It was done. And God said, no, it's, it's not quite done. So I want to, um, because of time, I want to just quickly share with you one other God story. We advanced five years along, 1991. It's now in my brain. And so I'm hearing that, and I say, okay, well, doctor, it's been a good run. I've lived a good 10 years, and I just thank you and for all you've done, and wow. And he says, God, don't, 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 don't. I, I think it's in a place where we can get it. And we can go in, and we can get the tumor, and whatever's left, we'll just get with radiation. So I say, okay, well, great, let's do it. So he ends up taking out a tumor the size of a lemon out of my frontal lobe, Two weeks later, I go back in and through radiation, or stereotactic radiation, they destroy two other tumors further down in my head. What I want to share with you is that with brain surgery, what comes with brain surgery is scar tissue. Um, they'll do the surgery and then because of where everything is, scar tissue is pretty common. And what scar tissue does is it can actually multiply and manipulate the brain to the point where you can have seizures. So I was cancer-free with seizures, which wasn't a lot of fun. But I want to tell you about my first seizure. My wife and I had gone to um, the Hastings Theater in Pasadena to see an afternoon movie. We saw the movie, and we got back in my car, and I was driving west on 210 back to Sunland, where we lived. And all of a sudden, going 65 miles an hour in the left lane, I have a grand mal seizure. Now, if you know what a grand mal seizure is, it simply means that you go unconscious. So the rest of the story, I'm telling you secondhand because it's what's told to me because I wasn't there. What I am told is that we are driving, and all of a sudden, I started seizing. And my wife was panicked over here. And luckily, luckily, maybe godly, I should say, I was seizing on the brake. And so the car was going back and forth, but slowing down. And my wife tells me she was able to reach over, grab the wheel that I had let go of, stick in her foot, and put on the brake, and stop the car in the left lane. Well, she says that she got out of the car, hysterical, not knowing what to do, and a woman drives up sees my wife and she immediately pulls in front of the car uh, in front of the car so that her front ends on, in the median and she gets out and is trying to comfort Pam and 
All of a sudden, two large delivery trucks come up from behind. One comes up in the lane next to us, and one comes up behind the car and cocoons my car. Um, they both get out, jump out, and they say, what do you want, what, do you, what can we do? And Pam, trying to get a control of herself, says, well, in, my husband is having a seizure. Please get him out of the car. So they run over to the car. In the midst of the chaos, she locked the keys in the car. What do you want us to do? Break a window. So they got their tools. They broke a window. They got me out of the car, and they set me down on the freeway. Great place to be. I'm unconscious. I have no idea. So they tell me they had to wait quite a while for the paramedics to get there, because they had to get through the traffic to get there. They finally got there, packed me up, put me on a gurney, took me to Huntington Memorial Hospital. The first thing I remember is going over the bump into the emergency room garage area. And uh, I kind of woke up then. And I wasn't having seizures anymore, but it was, uh, you know, I didn't know what to think. I had no memory of what had just happened. So they took me in, they filled me up with anti-seizure drugs, and by that afternoon, they sent me home. I mean, I was fine. I guess that's what you have when grandma seizures, they just hook you up and send you home. But on the way home with Pam, we were talking about what happened because I didn't know. And I was overwhelmed by the fact that we were going 65 miles an hour on a freeway. I have a seizure and nobody's dead. Yeah. How can I have gotten out of that yeah. and be alive? Yeah. How can my wife have gotten through that when I let go of the steering wheel going 65 miles an hour and we're still here? Only way that would have happened is that God yeah. was in that car. Yeah. Before I finish, let me just share with you, um, I want to go back to James. And the only way that we can do that is by being willing to deal with life as it throws stuff at you. You know, the trial you may go through could be some horrid, horrendous thing like cancer, the loss of a job, loss of a loved one through divorce or death. It could be just the pits. Or it could be having to get up on Monday morning knowing that you're going into the office and having to deal with that crazy personality you call a boss. Or it might be having just to get people off to school every single morning. Or sitting down at the computer and dealing with more spam today than yesterday. It's frustrating. The issue isn't the trial. The issue is what we do with it. Are we going to grouse and complain and just not grow? Or are we going to allow those circumstances which were un welcome circumstances to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to deal with it some way that I'm going to be something more tomorrow than I am today so that I can reach out and touch those around me that you set there, that you make these divine appointments. I'm going to be available to be your ambassador for those. That's what God wants from us. So whatever the trial is, we need to expect them and use them. Let me, let me say that um, I've gone through a lot, probably more than my share, but I promise you what I have gone through does not compare to what I have received. And it is such a joy to know that God is walking with me through this whole thing until whenever he chooses to uh, say the day is done. I'm there for him as he's been there for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, this opportunity to share. And I pray, Lord, that we would all recognize the fact that we have the ability to be your apostles, your people, your disciples, your individuals that are struggling to be the individual that you have created us to be. I pray that you would help us to be that tomorrow more than we are today. I know I'm not there yet, but I want to be there more tomorrow than today, and I pray that for every individual in this room. We bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.